And with that, I would uh, like to open it up for, for comments and uh, questions from, from anyone. Yes, ma'am. A, a treaty is a is a is an agreement between the United States and an Indian tribe, and uh, there are treaty powers of Congress uh, and the executive branch under the Constitution. And there was an era of, of treaty making uh, that occurred from 1776 until 1872. And in 1872, Congress uh, cut off the, the treaty making uh, with Indian tribes. And there have been no more treaties between Indian tribes and the United, the United States. Congress still does have uh, treaty, <coughs> treaty relationships with other foreign nations. Uh, a contract is, a, is an agreement between two parties with uh, consideration uh, and uh, you know, it has a, a binding effect and a mutual benefit to, to the parties. Uh, a compact is an intergovernmental agreement between uh, two sovereigns. It could be uh, between a, a state and a state, between an Indian tribe and a state, or uh, a local government uh, and an Indian tribe, or a local government and, uh, and the state. Uh, over issues of, uh, of common interest. So sovereign is the critical word there, sovereign entities? Yes, um, the, I, I believe that there are some compacts with, with local governments which are subdivisions of, of states and, and so forth. Yes, sir? Uh, <clears throat> we didn't get to this with the compact panel, but uh, in this legal environment that we have, what brings the two parties to the table to form a compact, and what is the points of leverage for each? It, with, with the state's limitations on ability to tax and regulate tribal activities, why should the tribe enter a compact at all? Well, the U.S. Supreme Court has had a, many occasions to address some of these issues, and uh, and some of the, the, the early um, disagreements uh, focused on tobacco uh, during the 1980s, and there were a series of decisions that the U.S. Supreme Court said that um, tribes cannot uh, market basically an, an exemption uh, for uh, tobacco products. And uh, states, uh, you know, sought to enforce against tobacco in, in particular. And uh, one example is uh, Oklahoma's experience with tribes and uh, the Citizen Potawatomi Nation and uh, the Oklahoma Tax Commission got into a disagreement in the late 80s and early 90s. And uh, the Oklahoma Tax Commission sued the tribes uh, to try to enforce uh, tax policy against the tribes. And the U.S. Supreme Court said uh, that while the tribes are uh, required to collect taxes for the tobacco products, the tribes were immune to suit, and the state couldn't haul them into court because as a sovereign, the, the, the tribe is entitled to sovereign immunity. So that has been a, um, a, a protection for the tribes and their governments to you know, be protected from unconsented suit. And uh, that Citizen Potawatomi Nation case from 1991, I think uh, really animated uh, the states and tribes to you know, try to work out some of these issues, particularly on motor fuel compacts and tobacco. And instead of fighting about it and going to court, um, you know, try to reach an agreement. So, you know, that that is uh, that the the state, you know, does does have some leverage in controlling the the territory in, in which the state has control of, and that the tribes have leverage through their self-government and their, their sovereign immunity and the recognition and protection from, from courts of self-government. Yes, sir? Um, of the cases that you've mentioned, which ones do you think will be coming into play in the water, in the water cases coming on, and how do you think that'll turn out? Well, water is, uh, is one of the, the most important issues, I, I think, uh, in, in the coming generations for Oklahomans and, and for Indian tribes. And uh, there's a, a number of unquantified uh, rights out there of Indian tribes that, that need to be taken into account. And uh, there's a, a case uh, from the 1960s uh, called U.S. versus California. 
uh, that, that talks about uh, you know water rights between states and uh, Indian tribes and uh, there's a case called the U.S. versus Winters from the early 1900s that recognizes that in Congress and and in uh, requiring tribes to uh, you know, exercise self-government and have their own reservations that the reservation should have a purpose and that part of that that right is a right to sufficient water to to uh, you know support Indian people on their Indian country. So uh, the Winters Doctrine uh, animates a lot of this, and U.S. versus California is, is also a foundation of, of some of these rights. Uh, and the general doctrines of uh, you know tribal sovereignty and, and the, the ability of self-government uh, will be respected by courts. These are these are really hard issues, and as as people and uh, get more thirsty and industries grow water is going to become more scarce and I'm, I'm glad that there's a you know a dialogue going on now in a in a um, in a constructive fashion I know that, that the Chickasaw Nation is in uh, very deep and and meaningful discussions with Oklahoma uh, about uh, some of these issues of common interest and hopefully you know these issues could be resolved uh, with both parties finding a win-win uh, solution Yes, sir. Can you uh, talk a little bit about the impact um, sovereign immunity has on private contracts between companies and and the tribes, particularly around kind of choice of law provisions and where perhaps disputes between a private company and the, the tribe would be settled? Sure. Uh, you know, I mentioned the judge-made doctrine of uh, tribal sovereign immunity and uh, Perhaps the, the most recent and important case on, on that, that topic uh, after the, the Citizen Potawatomi case in 1991 is the U.S. Supreme Court decision in Kiowa Tribe of Oklahoma versus Manufacturing Technologies Incorporated, the 1997 case, that basically reversed about five cases from the Oklahoma Supreme Court and said that tribes are immune to suit uh, absent a, a clear waiver of sovereign immunity. Uh, on or off of their Indian country. So it, it is a decision for a, a tribe to clearly and unequivocally waive it, its sovereign immunity, and they can do that by, by contract. There has been a subsequent case uh, that involved the Citizen Potawatomi uh, Nation. I believe that case is in uh, 2001, if I recall correctly, that said that uh, where a tribe entered into a uh, architectural agreement that had an arbitration provision, that that arbitration provision constituted a, uh, a clear and unequivocal waiver of sovereign immunity. Uh, these days, tribes and non-Indians uh, negotiate uh, those terms, be it you know choice of law, be it the forum where, where a, a matter would be resolved, or what kind of a forum would, would be uh, resolved. I've been involved in a, a number of these cases. In fact, we just won a, a case on Tuesday in U.S. District Court in Oklahoma City uh, involving a uh, contract dispute and about whether tribal court would apply or uh, arbitration would apply. Uh, so those are, you know, issues that, that lawyers, uh, you know, can work with the, the, the parties to, you know, find uh, common ground of, of what's in the best interest of the parties. Some some parties want to. Uh, you know, want to do business together, and uh, and they agree that the the tribes' courts will resolve any disputes. And I've seen that work very successfully and uh, very fairly. Uh, the Cherokee Nation, for example, has a very well developed uh, tribal court system with multiple judges, uh, lawyer trained judges, uh, a very advanced uh, tribal supreme court, and and a very fair one. Uh, back here in the back. I guess tribes could be terminated from federal recognition. Can you describe the process that a tribe could go through to become federally recognized and somehow that takes place? Sure. Uh, you know, I mentioned the termination era back in the 1950s, and uh, a number of tribes uh, fell under the, the acts of Congress where they were just written out of existence. Uh, there was something called Public Law 280 in which uh, uh, Congress said that states could choose to um, 
uh, take over jurisdiction of tribes, criminally or civilly, uh, if they so choose. Uh, and there have been a number of cases that, that dealt with that. Um, so, you know, under the, uh, the plenary power doctrine uh, from some of the early cases I discussed, uh, you know, the Supreme Court has said that Congress has the power to do that. Now, there are some tribes uh, out there that, um, you know, had been pushed away during the removal era. Um, they, they hid out in the mountains, they hid out in the swamps. Uh, for example, the, uh, the Seminole tribe of Florida, um, that was a, a band, an offshoot of the, the Seminole Nation that didn't go on the, the Trail of Tears, that didn't go out to Oklahoma, uh, where most of the Seminoles got, that got pushed out, and they, they hid out in the swamps and formed their own government. Um, but there, there are some bands of uh, Indians that uh, you know, have had a continual existence, and there's a procedure under the federal regulations administered by the Department of Interior in which tribes can apply and prove uh, their continuous existence and meet certain criteria uh, through the historic record and so forth to achieve recognition again. The Indian Gaming Regulatory Act of 1988 um, um, brought about uh, recognition of uh, when Indian lands can uh, be placed into, in, into trust for gaming purposes. and. Uh, in, in recent decades, uh, a number of disputes have arisen about you know, new tribes coming on board and whether they can get land and put it into trust as a newly recognized, newly restored tribe. So those are some of the, the modern issues that the courts are grappling with, the Department of Interior and Congress are, are grappling with as well. Over here. Well, first, uh, I, that's a good point, and I, that was hope, that was something I, I hoped I'd have time to address, and that is the distinction between Indian and Native American. Uh, first, Indian is a misnomer. It, it's Christopher Columbus going way off course and thinking he wound up in India, but it has entered the uh, the legal lexicon uh, in Congress and our laws of Indian uh, and. You know, we have four volumes of uh, 25 United States Code uh, that references Indians. And so, uh, you know, that, that's sort of old school terminology. And I, I know lots of uh, older Native Americans that, that like to, you know, be called Indian. I know some younger generation people, though, that, that think it's pejorative and uh, don't like it and they, they want to be called Native Americans. I use it interchangeably and uh, but I, I do primarily, though, because it, it, it is in the legal vernacular and the legal lexicon. Your second question is uh, gaming dollars, uh, building governments, and what do, what do I foresee in the future of changing laws? Well, tribes are, uh, you know, I mentioned the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act in 1988. It, it's been the most successful economic development policy in the, the history of the United States. And it has really uh, uh, brought tremendous revenue to tribes. I mean, for example, uh, this past year, I, I think that tribes had a collective uh, amount of uh, $28 billion in revenue. I, I kept hearing the word profits bandied about earlier, and I, and I think that's a misnomer. It's government revenue. Uh, tribes, only Indian tribes can engage in, in um, and Indian gaming, and they, they can only do it on, on Indian lands and, and under the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act. That money can only be used for five or so specified purposes. Social services, uh, different programs, contributions to local governments and state governments or charitable organizations. Uh, it, it, isn't, uh, it isn't profit, it, it's, it's government revenue and it's government gaming. So uh, I, I think that that's an important d d distinction to be made. I agree with Attorney General Hembree that uh, 
it, it is likely that uh, we will see a continued plateau and perhaps decline of, uh, of gaming revenues and that uh, gaming might, may not last forever. We have a lot of influences. Uh, we had the possibility of internet gaming, uh, you know, coming on board where people could uh, engage in gaming in their pajamas in their bedroom. Uh, and, you know, we have uh, pressures from other foreign jurisdictions. Uh, we have changing uh, policies and laws in different states. Oklahoma and uh, Oklahoma tribes are blessed that a, a number of our surrounding states don't have such permissive uh, uh, policies for gaming. For example, the, the Chickasaw Nation uh, and the Choctaw Nation that derive considerable benefit from Texans rolling across the border and uh, enjoying the hospitality of, of their casinos and their, their hotels. Uh, and I've, I've heard some estimates of, uh, you know, up to 80% of uh, the 90% of the gamers at uh, Windstar and other facilities are, are Texans. So thank you, Texas. But, but <laughs> what happens if the Texas legislature, uh, uh, you know, enables uh, casinos uh, next session? You know, that could have a, a huge impact not only on the Chickasaw Nation but on our Oklahoma economy. So that, that's uncertainty that, you know, I, I don't know what's gonna happen, but I think wise tribes, uh, uh, wise leaders, you know, like Chief Baker are building up their infrastructures, looking at other economic development opportunities, building the, the social infrastructures, and enjoying, uh, you know, this revenue in a, in a positive way. I, I think that, you know, potentially it could, um, but I, I think that, you know, strong tribal governments are a wonderful thing. I mean, you, you've seen the benefit in Oklahoma of strong tribal governments and, and how it lifts everyone, uh, non-Indians alike, you know, from the, the health care, the jobs, and so forth, and I, I, I think that the, the policies that we've seen of self-determination will continue, and I don't envision that that, that policy is gonna change, uh, hopefully not in my lifetime, but you never can tell with uh, you know, changing Congresses. Yes, sir? Um, has there been in the past a, an exception to the anti-marijuana laws because of, of, for the use of religion, religious ceremonies for the tribes, and as states are now legalizing it, do you think that, that any of the Indian nations will join into that? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, right. for, first, <laughs> <laughs> for, you know, that, that, that brings in uh, lots of considerations. Uh, you know, first, uh, there's an overriding federal law. I mean, even in Colorado, the U.S. Department of Justice could choose to prosecute uh, medical marijuana dispensaries because it is in violation of, of federal law. The Obama administration has released a, uh, the Department of Justice has released a uh, memorandum though that they're not going to uh, enforce those laws against uh, medical dispensaries and, and recreational marijuana in Colorado, for example, or, or Washington State, uh, unless if it's being uh, trafficked across state lines or to, to minors. Uh, Indian tribes get into the, this business. I, I think that uh, you know perhaps in a, within a jurisdiction like Colorado or, or Washington, where it, where it is lawful, that 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 could be an opportunity. Uh, in a place like Oklahoma, I, I think that there are uh, enforcement uh, and legal uh, problems with that, um, and I think that it, it could create uh, some backlash in Congress of specifically targeted laws if, if that kind of conduct were to, to occur. In 1983, the U.S. Supreme Court decided a case called Rice versus Renner that dealt with uh, liquor on reservations and uh, whether state laws would apply to, to regulate uh, liquor. And the U.S. Supreme Court uh, looked at that and said that uh, it wasn't within the, the custom and tradition of Indian tribes to, uh, to regulate alcohol 
so therefore, uh, the tribes must comply with federal law and, and state law in the, in the realm of, uh, of liquor regulation. So I, I see that that is an analogy that, um, you know, that, that could inform uh, policy for such things as uh, medical marijuana or recreational marijuana by, by Indian tribes. I see we have five minutes. Yes, sir. From a forensic perspective, if there was a crime such as a homicide or another uh, or a drug or an issue from a, that may have involved a forensic investigation, how would they handle that? Is it handled through the state or federal court or is it through, I mean, such a bit of murder or something atrocious like that would happen on the Area. How, how is that handled? Who has jurisdiction over it? Well, uh, that, that can be kind of a complicated uh, question, but, but first, uh, you know, through our cooperative agreements between uh, tribal law enforcement and state law enforcement and federal law enforcement, uh, uh, law officers work together uh, to uh, work on and, and respond to and solve these crimes. Um, for example, within the Cherokee Nation, it, you know, if a crime happened over here on Indian Country, um, more than likely a Cherokee Marshal is going to be the first responder and would uh, probably secure the perimeter. And uh, it, depending on whether the victim was a, a Indian or non-Indian, Cherokee or non-Cherokee, could inform whether uh, the state would have an interest in uh, the prosecution or investigation of the crime. Uh, if an Indian was involved, uh, if it happened on Indian country, it could be a major crime that the federal courts would have jurisdiction over and the US, U.S. attorneys would prosecute. But because of these uh, cooperative uh, agreements, uh, the compacts, uh, there is a lot of uh, working together and backing each other up to you know, address law enforcement and crime within Indian country. If in that case you get held up for murder, where does he go? If, if it goes through the Indian court, any convicted, what happens? Well, there, there is no double jeopardy. Um, the, the individual could be prosecuted in, in tribal court yeah, for murder, of murder, but the Indian Civil Rights Act limits the, the fine and the amount of detention that uh, Indian tribal court could impose. The federal court would, be, um, would have jurisdiction uh, and the federal sentencing guidelines would, you know, provide the the uh, the remedies. Yes, sir. So, how do you see? Um, do the tribes get together? Uh, say that there's a federal issue out there; they work together, either be at the federal level or state level. And do you see them becoming more friendly and uh, coming together to attack certain issues as it? all around treaties, compacts, and things. Absolutely. There's lots of organizations uh, that, that work together. Uh, you know, uh, Governor Anatebi is a member of a group called the uh, Five Tribes Council, and, and they, uh, they get together on a regular basis, quarterly basis, I believe, to talk about issues of interest, uh, you know, with Chief Baker, the Cherokee Nation, Choctaw Nation, Seminole Nation, Muscogee Creek Nation. Uh, Next week in Washington, D.C., the National Congress of American Indians is, is meeting on a legislative summit uh, to talk about issues at the federal level on, on a policy perspective. And I'm, I know that Attorney General Hembury is going there next week to you know, talk, and they, they have meetings throughout the year. And they have an annual meeting, usually in the, the fall. Yeah, but they also have disagreements. Yes. Yeah, there's disagreements between small tribes and large tribes and gaming tribes and non-gaming tribes. Uh, there, there's lots of uh, variation between 566 uh, fairly recognized Indian tribes and Alaska Native groups. But we also have a Native American caucus within the, the state of Oklahoma legislature and they just met about three weeks ago and uh, they come together on, on occasion to talk about issues of uh, legislative interest. Just yesterday I'm informed that the the House passed a uh, tribal Medicaid uh, bill, uh, which will benefit uh, Native Americans. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much for this opportunity. <laughs>